Welcome, everyone. I'm Luke Bedimer. I'm one of the reporters at Tortoise, and I'm absolutely over the moon um, to get the chance to, to speak to David Chalmers at this thinking, um, where we'll be asking, what is the metaverse? Um, David J. Chalmers is a university professor of philosophy um, and co-director of the Center for Mind, Brain and Consciousness um, at New York University. Uh, his previous books include The Conscious Mind um, and Constructing the World, but hopefully we're going to, to make reference to his most recent book. Um, he, he's known for formulating the hard problem of consciousness, which asks how can physical systems the, the physical systems of our of our brain be conscious things um, and has also sort of posited the idea that the tools that we use can also become part of our minds. Um, and that's an idea that I think is particularly interesting in in light of um, emerging metaverse technologies. So um, I really encourage everybody in the room to weigh in if you've not been to a thinking before. Um, all you need to do is, is raise your digital hand or um, put your comments in the chat where my colleague Zav Greenwood will be looking out for them. Um, I hope, I mean, I, I hope we're going to be able to talk about what the metaverse is, but, but also about why that matters. Um, and it's great to have David to, um, to help us pick a line through this subject because it feels like more has been said about the metaverse in the past few months than potentially in the past few decades combined. But I'm not sure if all of that talking has led to better understanding. So um, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna start by saying that the um, that David's book um, I, I had the pleasure of looking really into it over the over the past few days and found that. It did something quite unique in its combination of not only philosophy, but psychology, religion, computer science, and um, helpfully a lot of references to popular culture, um, not least the matrix, which is hopefully something we'll get to speak about, um, to make it very relatable and, and a doorway into this subject, which I think for some people can be quite daunting. So I hope this thinking can be a sort of mini version of that, a doorway into the concept of the metaverse um, and why it matters. Um, David, welcome. Thanks, Luke. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you. Yeah, so I, 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 was, <laughs> I was tempted to ask the question to you up front, what is the metaverse? Mm -hmm. And I actually think I'm gonna do that because it would be helpful to get your take and then see if there are piece, pieces of it that we can pick apart and examine as we go on, and then also move on to that piece about why it matters. So David, what, what is the metaverse? Yeah, it's a good question. And the term metaverse has actually evolved, I think, over the years. It was introduced by uh, Neil Stevenson in his 1992 novel, Snow Crash, which is a work of science fiction, as a name for a large and immense virtual world, a computer generated world, that people could enter, could interact with. It was fully immersive. It felt as if they were present in that world with a, you know, a, a virtual world all around them. And it was a social world. It was a world where people interacted with other people, carried on ordinary social activities, built relationships, built communities, worked, played, roughly you know, carried on many of the ordinary activities that you carry on in the physical world, but in a virtual world. So I think, and he called that the metaverse. So I think the original meaning of metaverse was something like a massive online virtual world in which you can carry on many of the, uh, many of the activities of ordinary physical reality. This might mm -hmm. contrast with say a game world, which is also a, a virtual world, but if it's just being used for gaming purposes, you probably wouldn't call it a metaverse. Yeah. And so so do you do you feel like that idea has matured at all since since 1992 and Snow Crash? So certainly there have been quite a lot of virtual worlds, um, perhaps the most famous of which is Second Life, uh, which hit its peak around 2007, 2007 had uh, many people interacting in this world, building communities, building relationships. But it wasn't a true metaverse. It wasn't a true virtual reality because it wasn't yet immersive it wasn't mm. something that we experienced 
uh, in three dimensions all around us as a virtual reality. These days, virtual reality technology is getting big with, for example, the Oculus Quest. You, know, you put it on and suddenly you're experiencing a virtual world immersively all around you. So I think to be a genuine metaverse in Neil Stevenson's sense, you have to be an immersive virtual world in which you carry on many of the activities of the physical world. But that said, the term has actually come to change its meaning somewhat recently. For a long time, people said, I am building a metaverse, meaning you know, a world like the metaverse. I'm building Second Life. I'm building, uh, there are worlds like you know, Alt Space or VR, yeah. type, which people called metaverses. In the last year or so, and especially with, uh, with Mark Zuckerberg's big launch and rebranding of Facebook as, uh, as Meta, which he announced as intending to pursue the metaverse. I think the metaverse has come to mean something more like the sum total of all virtual worlds or the sum mm. total of all environments, digital environments that you experience immersively from the inside, particularly with virtual reality technology and augmented reality technology. Yeah. So it's no longer just a single world. Um, it's roughly, it's the whole space of virtual worlds. One definition that I like for this new meaning of metaverse is the immersive internet. It's, a, you know, it's like the internet, it's a global network of digital environments, but unlike today's internet, it's experienced immersively, spatially yeah. in three dimensions using virtual reality technology, using, uh, using augmented reality glasses and so on. That is what people now I think are trying to build. Yeah. So I'd love to um, stick with the, the concept of immersiveness, because I think it's a really interesting theme and the idea of the, the technology that supports it. But there was something you said there that was very interesting, and it, it actually relates, I think, directly to something that um, Paul Clark had said right off the bat in the chat, which is that there are going to be many different metaverses rather than just one. Um, so do you see the the process underway at the moment since the rebrand of Facebook to Meta and that kind of the idea of um, funneling all of this metaverse interest into one metaverse that a, a company can own. Do you feel that's a sort of, that's a deviation from the, the core concept of what metaverses are? It's interesting. I think here is where like the rebranding has really made a difference. Two years ago, I would have, I would have agreed with what Paul's saying that as we were talking about Metaverses, yeah, there will be many metaverses. We can expect, um, you know, Meta to set up a metaverse, and Apple to set up a metaverse, and micro Microsoft to set up a metaverse, each with their own platform for virtual worlds. Mm. I think the way the term is now being used, it's almost by definition, there's just a single metaverse, just as there's just a single internet. Nobody talks about, hey, we have multiple internets. Yeah. Um, there's just one internet with many different platforms on the internet. And I think in this rebranding, it's come to be the case that the word metaverse now stands for the sum total of all of these platforms in some kind yeah. of giant network. And there will be, we can say there'll be many different metaverse platforms. We can say there are many, many different metaverse worlds, one set up by Meta, one set up by Apple and, and so mm. on. But I think, yeah, to say metaverses now, I think strikes many people's ears yeah. as, as a bit odd. That is really interesting. That so, just in that short space of time, it has become a more universal concept, and there might be many different ways into it. Um, it, it reminds me of two things. One is an illustration in your book of Mark Zuckerberg in Plato's cave, uh -huh. um, but, but then the other is I, I wrote down a question um, that you you published Reality Plus very shortly before the announcement, and I wonder if you could just quickly tell us sort of how did that how, how would you change what you argue or what you identify in the book now versus what, what you, you've chosen in the months before? Yeah, well, of course, this was, uh, my book went to, uh, went to press, you know, in the middle of last year. And just a few months later, um, Mark Zuckerberg made this big announcement about the metaverse. Now, fortunately, I had quite, a, I'd written quite a lot about the metaverse in the book. I tended to use it in the, uh, with the old meaning of your know, metaverse as a single virtual world or a single platform. But uh, I managed to work in just after the Zuckerberg speech, I managed to work in some last minute changes to accommodate that meaning as well. You know, the sum total 
of all virtual worlds. But um, yeah, it was very exciting uh, for me to see that there was this, certainly the Zuckerberg speech had the effect yeah. of just exploding interest in all these issues about virtual worlds. In retrospect, if I'd known six months sooner, I might've given my book a slightly different subtitle. It's a okay. title's Reality Plus. Uh, the subtitle is Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy. Perhaps in retrospect, I ought to have called the subtitle ought to have been The Matrix, the Metaverse, and the Problems of Philosophy. Right. After all, we got a fourth Matrix movie in December. We got the Metaverse in, uh, in October. And these are the two great virtual worlds of science fiction, at least, The Matrix yeah. and the Metaverse. They also very nicely illustrate the central themes of the book. The Matrix stands for the idea that all this, our actual environment could turn out to be a computer simulation. One, something I spent a lot of time talking about yeah. in the book, but the metaverse stands for the, the much more practical idea of the virtual worlds that we are now building and will be constructing over coming decades. And about half the book is about that. So I now realize that I could have had a much sexier title with the matrix, the metaverse and the yeah. problems of philosophy, but you live and you learn. Yeah, you actually do. It does make it look quite prescient though i mean the, the book is sort of r riddled with quotes and observations and stuff about the matrix which had an evolution in in the form of the fourth film and and obviously um all of the stuff that happened with facebook that kind of brings us i, I hope to back to this thing of, of immersiveness because what i observed was there there's a bit of a horseshoe effect where the metaverse and the matrix actually start to may start to meet again around the, the extent of immersiveness because one of the, the the readings of metaverse technologies right now the vr experiences that are available with the quest headset and um they can be really amazing and I, I can see that my uh colleague liz is s s singing some of their praises in in how cool and uh, sort of interesting an experience it is but you still know that you're looking at a a, a bit screen that's a, an inch or so in front of your eyes and you still know that you're in a room in your house and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the the immersiveness now and and how you see the idea of immersiveness or the the, the kind of characteristic of immersiveness changing as we go forward yeah I mean it's gotten quite good but the world still are quite primitive so um I would say that yeah when I'm in a virtual reality like say Beat Saber which I see Liz mentions, um, it really feels as if you're there. And that is the mark of immersiveness, to really feel as if you're in this environment where things are really happening around you. That said, it's also very clearly a virtual environment. It's somewhat cartoonish, doesn't have the texture of physical reality. So I guess I expect that over the next 10 or 20 years, um, the technology is going to develop so that first it gets much more textured, ultimately yeah. becoming you know, photorealistic on a par of the way physical reality looks and sounds. It's also very clunky right now. You know, these headsets are very irritating things to put on your, uh, to put on your face. Yeah. Um, they, uh, yeah, they're kind of heavy after an hour or so, it's usually enough and you want to get out. So I think that form factor is mm. going to change. Uh, there's been, a, you know, everyone hopes that the eventual form factor is a pair of glasses that might be used for augmented reality. You see the physical world and you see virtual objects at the same time, or might just be used for digital objects. In fact, just today, um, there was an announcement by one of the big companies in the augmented reality sector, Magic Leap, mm. which had already uh, previously uh, released some glasses for augmented reality of the Magic Leap 2, which among other features is gonna have what's called, a, I think, a reality dimmer. Mm. a dimmer of physical reality so that if you want to you can so set of glasses but if you want to you can use it to uh to cut out physical reality and have pure virtual reality or if you raise the dimmer then you'll have physical reality plus digital reality what's sometimes called mixed reality so that's also i think a potential once i think right now virtual reality experience with glasses is not as impressive yeah. as virtual reality experience with a headset but i think give it 10 20 years I think um, then the, the ideal form factor is going to be these glasses, which are extremely convenient, very powerful computers built in, which can mm. which can uh, give you access to very, very convincing virtual objects. 
Yeah, so uh, um, it would be great to hear from Thais uh, Portillo. Apologies if I not pronounced your name correctly, but you raise a, a good point about the actual use of these technologies as they are now. So, but could I just quickly ask David, so form factor, does that mean the sort of proportion, what, what, is, what is form factor? Well, I, I'm thinking of the form factor of the, uh, the headset, you know, the actual okay, okay. shape and build. Yeah, so the things that you hold, the things you have to attach to your body, yeah, that might make quite a big difference to what it is actually like to experience right. these these things. Okay, um, Tyus, do you, are you there? Do you want to um, do you want to speak? Hi, hi. Yes. Um. So, is it about my question about migraines? <laughs> um, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I so, I yes, I I do. I I've um I've used Oculus a few times, and I have tried to play some of the metaverse games on my laptop and it's just uh, it's impossible i i can do five perhaps ten minutes and and then it's just really difficult for me to continue the mm. migraines start and i know a lot of people suffer from migraines and it is it, it, it's it's especially i guess uh, even um pr possibly a problem that affects women more than men and and so it would be a shame if people like me were left out of this mm. space um yeah because of this and um I, I don't know exactly. I mean, I don't think there is much research behind it. Um, and I don't know exactly what it is that causes it. I, I have read a few things about um, the speed of frames, um, and I, but I, I don't know how scientific that is. So um, it would be really interesting to find out, you know, what the problem is, why it, it, it you know, it, it sort of, it, it's worse for people who have propensity for migraines mm. and if there will be any solution ever. Yeah, well, that, that feels like one of the significant things to add to a list of con concerns and potential issues of bias and who, who will be able to access this. I, um, Tyson, I, I'd love to come back to that kind of topic. Um, maybe if we, we could try and challenge some of the things about um, the safety and the inclusiveness of these technologies. So I, I, I'll, I've i got a note of that, but I'd love um, to just make a point um, further to what Paul Clark was saying, which is about interoperability. So you've got the meta hardware there and the meta platform as a way of experiencing something in the metaverse and other, other companies can build their own um, iterations of that. What is there, David, to make them speak to one another or create experiences that are joined up? It's a good question and a really important question. To what extent, you know, this metaverse, the successor to the internet, is going to be fragmented, and to what extent it's going to be unified? You know, the internet mm. got started in this, you know, amazingly unified way with these, you know, open standards and protocols that govern the whole thing. Over time, it's gotten platformized, and you know, there are many different all these walled gardens and platforms out there on the internet, but they've still got this, you know, this fundamental structure that connects them. And it's a somewhat open question whether the metaverse is gonna end up with that same kind of open structure that connects. I mean, there's sure to be many different metaverse platforms yeah. working, in, working in different ways, but will they be somehow, will there be some underlying common structure that one can use to navigate the metaverse as there is yeah. for navigating the internet? I mean, there will at least be the internet, you know, presumably, yeah. uh, which can be used to connect to all these uh, metaverses. But will there be something more? I did read that uh, Apple appears to be embracing some open standards, such as uh, WebXR, the web standards for extended reality on the web, uh, coding mm. language, uh, which is at least uh, interesting. But, it, you know, it may well be a, a question of who develops uh, the first most influential metaverse yeah. platform platforms and how they implement that. I mean, it's probably, the, you know, there's probably not going to be a universal standard for like, say, for designing virtual worlds because the technology is just moving so fast and there'll be people who want to, you know, overthrow the old standards very fast. So I think it's an open yeah. question how unified it will be. So re reading into, reading that idea of the unification versus being the first to, to implement the best platforms, that kind of seems to tell us quite a lot about Mark Zuckerberg's decision um, to, to change the path of this massive company. Um, he, he said something in an interview recently that I, I wanted to see what you made of it. 
he, he was speaking about the metaverse, I think in reference to some other idea he'd heard, but he said that he liked the idea that the metaverse is not a place or a thing, but a point in time at which humans overwhelmingly experience interactions with one another and life in general through immersive digital experiences rather than anything else. Um, what, what, like, what, what do you make of that? It's not, it's not necessarily about the technology or a, a place, but the time in human history when we're more willing to, or, or ready to, to be sort of really heavily involved. Yeah, I think, well, that's a nice expression of the, uh, you know, the spirit of the metaverse. I think there may be some skepticism out there about how committed, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is to this very open metaverse and to what extent yeah. he wants, uh, you know, meta to somehow trademark and, uh, and dominate the, uh, the metaverse. But I very much like, I mean, I like the idea of it being a, uh, you know, a basically a new, a new form of life that we're gradually going to be, uh, going to be inhabiting. And just as you know, forms of life change regularly every 50 years. Our environments change regularly. I mean, the internet has already led to new forms of life for many mm. people that in some ways will probably dominate, say, the history of the world. When you think about the history of the world from the 1990s to the 2020s, yeah, the internet is just going to be such a very central part of that history. I think the hope is, well, if you look at the history of the world from, say, I don't know, 2030 to 2060, perhaps the metaverse could play a... Uh, a corresponding role. This will be the time where people really started, you know, inhabiting uh, virtual worlds for more than just gaming purposes yeah. and started living many aspects of their life there. It, so I, I think there's the, it, there's a there's a line in your book where you say virtual worlds need not be second class realities. Mm -hmm. um, they can surpass life in physical reality lead to meaningful, valuable things and genuine interactions with others. Um, I, I wanted to sort of highlight that quote to see what you mean by it at sort of a, a deeper level, um, because it sounds like it can be. But what, why do you think that? Why do you think that virtual worlds need not be different or worse or lesser than than the physical reality that we live in now? Yeah, so I'm a philosopher who thinks about uh who thinks about reality. So these questions are fascinating for, uh, for me. And even among people who are quite sympathetic with virtual reality, you get this line that they're second class a lot. William Gibson said cyberspace, meaning virtual reality, is a consensual hallucination. It's all a hallucination. In Ready Player One, you hear um, reality is the only thing that's real, meaning physical reality is the only thing that's real. And I want to combat that. I want to think that... Uh, what goes on in virtual reality, the objects you encounter in virtual reality are real objects, you know, the, the avatars, the buildings, the treasures, and so on, mm. the environments, the conversations, they're all, they're all real things. They may be digital, but that doesn't mean they're any less real. I mean, we've got this tendency to contrast the digital or the virtual and the real. There are words, people still say IRL in yeah. real life for, uh, for what goes on outside the digital realm but I think we've learned that what goes on inside the digital life the digital world that is real life um, real things are happening I want to say real things are happening in virtual world so I'd rather we talked about maybe IPL in physical life right I don't know, IVL maybe in virtual life but I really think if you look at it philosophically you know digital entities are just as real as physical entities they're just different and virtual reality it makes a huge difference in all of our lives and virtual reality need not be an illusion. So I think mm. it should be acknowledged as reality. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I unfortunately, I don't know the real name, but MM in the chat has raised a good point that begins with the question, what is the long term good of the metaverse? If it's something that's being developed at the moment, what is the long term good that it stands to do? And I, it would be interesting to put that question to you, David. But there's there was a, another quote in your book that says virtual worlds will not be some sort of utopia like the Internet. VR technology will almost certainly lead to awful things as well as wonderful things. And I feel like that statement, it, it chimes with the question MM's asking about long-term good and potentially also long-term harm. What, what, what do you think would, will be the long-term good of the metaverse? 
Yeah, and I, you know, these questions sort of right, they rise together. Long-term potential for huge benefits and potential for huge harms. But where the where the benefits are concerned, I mean, I think just minimally, there's you know new forms of embodiment and new form new environments where you could do things that were impossible before. Already, I think you know better access to reality. Many people's access to physical reality is quite uh, is quite limited. Take uh, you know disabled people aging people, some people in oppressed societies have trouble, you know, having the full degree of access to physical reality that would be ideal and have actually already benefited significantly from um, being in virtual realities where they can build communities and mm. from, from all around the world and live in some ways a more uh, engaged life in many, uh, in many respects. Um, yeah. I think also... Yeah, the power of course communication is going to be i mean to be in a room together uh to be in a room together now you've got to be in a in the same physical space i mean zoom is helping but in the long run in vr we're going to be able to instantly travel across yeah. the metaverse and be with anybody i also think though that there's um potential kind of social political benefits tied to the fact that the digital world is digital objects are abundant uh in principle i mean Philosophers sometimes say that scarcity is a condition on on justice, or especially mm. on injustice. You get injustice in the world when things are scarce. You get inequality when when uh, goods are are hard to make, say food or shelter or whatever. When they're costly, um, then you get scarcity and inequality. In VR, there's this feature that you know digital objects can be duplicated trivially. You know, to build a house in physical reality that takes money. Yeah, work, but to build a new house in virtual reality, that can be done just trivially. It's uh, it's almost cost free to mm. build an extra house. So that opens the possibility that goods in VR could potentially be uh, be abundant. Yeah, uh, with possible forms here of yeah, really helping. I think the quest for social justice. It won't remove all problems of inequality, but I do think there are major benefits there. At the same time, we also know that corporations, market forces, and so, so on are likely to resist that. Um, we already see things like the NFT, the non-fungible token, which mm. is precisely a, uh, a tool for taking something that looks like it might be abundant, like a digital object that can be freely duplicated and marking one of them, the original, as the one that, uh, that matters, that carries a premium yeah. somehow. So I think it's an open question, but I think there is potential for all kinds of transformative developments. Yeah. Um, th thanks very much, David. I'd love to bring in another David, David Lane, who's made some very interesting points in the chat. Are you there, David? Yes, hi. Uh, uh, please go. Please work away, because actually, you were talking about gamers. You were talking about context collapse, and I, I, I won't do it justice. So please, Luke, you're very kind. Hello, David. Um, <clears throat> some gamers I know don't like the idea of the metaverse. They talk of context collapse. It's like being in an open plan office that. Lots of people are in the same space and information that should go to one person actually goes to lots of people. And if you're a gamer, you're in with your tribe. Um, uh, and it made me wonder, why did Second Life lose popularity? It may be an unrelated issue. Anyway, it's a, it's a worrying aspect, I think. Um, and what effect, my, I guess my question is, I'm not supposed to ask questions. What's, what will the effect be on the way the metaverse develops if it's like that? Yeah, it's interesting. Why? Why should the metaverse be limited in this respect? I mean, the very fact that this has happened with gaming, that you get people get to choose their tribe and their world and their, uh, and their worldview, I guess I, I would think of that as a demonstration of what is possible in this respect with the metaverse more generally. If it's happened with games, it ought to be able to happen with the metaverse, this, you know, this development of many different communities, many different worlds for, uh, for different groups and different tribes. Is the idea that is the worry that Facebook is going to like Meta is going to homogenize it? So there's one world that we all hang out in in the same way. I find that a much less attractive vision. Um, the philosopher Robert Nozick, in talking about the idea of utopia, once suggested what we really need is a meta utopia. There's no single utopian world for us to inhabit. What we actually need is some kind of choice between you know different worlds set up in different ways, so different people can all find their utopia. And that seems to be mm. what you're describing. In the case of gaming, I would hope that something like that could be carried over to uh, to the metaverse. I, I think it's an extremely interesting notion that, and not least because there's a, a, another part in Reality Plus where you say 
if we create simulated worlds ourselves, we'll be the gods of those worlds. Um, that the people who create worlds in which we would have virtual experiences of reality are the gods. And I, I think in that case, you don't mean a sort of, it, it, it's a metaphorical god as in an ultimate sort of controller of pulling the strings at the top. And there's a brilliant illustration of a hacker god who's a teenage girl writing the sort of script for this uh, world that she's generating. Um, when I think about that concept being the god of the world, the virtual world we've created, I think of Mark Zuckerberg and I think of his face and I think of the, the horrible track record that that business has of playing God in many ways, manipulating our decisions, manipulating the information we see or don't see. Um, and I would love to go back to a point um, that Bex Felton made in the chat, but also Victoria Baines has made, which is about moderation. Um, Victoria, if you're there, it would be great to hear your thoughts and then we can try and cover that kind of that whole idea with David. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, so one of the questions I have is about, well, just thoughts I have is around what moderation could look like. I think particularly with kind of the growing pressure with like the online safety bill coming in and a growing pressure on platforms and governments to be able to respond to platform, um, to online harms and whether this pressure will remain in the metaverse and how that would work, particularly sort of assuming in virtual worlds that there is a shift towards activity rather than shareable content. Um, I have VR chat, as far as I'm aware, one of its moderation mechan mechanisms is having sort of invisible moderators, which I think is very interesting in terms of surveillance and in many ways isn't too different from the ways in which we can't see who is currently moderating our social media feeds. Mm. But when, I think it is different when someone can, it's like someone sitting over your shoulder and watching you scroll watching the messages you type but don't send. Um, and, or sort of, is there gonna be more emphasis on user functionality? So around, so quite um, one of the design responses to the issues of sexual assault and physical assault in VR has been mm. around safety bubbles, which I think are really important and what a lot of victims have called for and it's really important that that's listened to. But I think, I wonder if putting that emphasis on users is going to result in more victim blaming of like, well, you know, you should have had your safety bubble up. Um, everyone knows that's how you start getting assaulted in VR. Um, and yeah, so I think there's, yeah, there's a lot of challenges and I don't have a solution. Yeah. But yeah, lots to think about with it. Yeah. No, I, th I think that there certainly is a lot there, Victoria. I, David, maybe to sort of funnel that down into one thing, which is, are, are we are we right to be concerned about having businesses as, as gatekeepers setting the rules of these experiences that we're allowed into, particularly when the online space at the moment is not without its serious, serious problems of harm and, um, and abuse. Yeah, it's such a, it's such a difficult issue. And I think, yeah, there are just such obvious problems tied to the roles of corporations in setting up these worlds. I mean, because yeah, right now, almost every virtual world is set up by some kind of corporation. And as you're saying, the corporations have these massive powers over the world, the godlike powers. They created the world. They're potentially all knowing. They can know exactly what's going on in those worlds. They're potentially all powerful. They can manipulate um, those worlds. They have an extraordinary degree of control. And there's a question, yeah, to what extent they should use it, um, to what extent it's reasonable for them to use it, but also to what extent it's reasonable for them not to use it. I actually kind of, I feel for the corporations here, even, even Facebook or, or Meta, say for social media, because there's just this, this kind of dilemma if they control what's going on in the world, then they're uh, then they're manipulating the people in the world, and that's um, and that's going to be subject to all kinds of uh, all kinds of abuses. People don't want corporate. We don't want corporations to be manipulating our physical environment, so we likewise mm. don't want this in virtual environments. But if they don't control the world, then they're allow you know then they're allowing anything to happen, and terrible things will happen, and they will be. Uh, it looks like they will be responsible for that. Yeah. So and we've already seen that with, uh, say, with with Facebook. Either they get they get pinged for manipulating, or they get pinged for allowing things to yeah. happen. And it's just very hard to see how to avoid that when a uh, when a corporation is in charge of the world. I mean, you can try and find some middle ground with some minimal amount of policing, mm. not much beyond that. But it's it's very hard to find that middle ground, and especially as long as these worlds are going to be free then the corporations are always going to 
you're going to have to monetize it somehow, and that's going to involve some degree of, of manipulation. So I very yeah. much hope there are going to turn out to be models which are not corporate dominated. There'll be you know user governed and user controlled virtual world, maybe even state governed and state controlled virtual worlds as well, yeah. or you know the various decent mechanisms of decentralization. I think. So it's just going to have to be a whole lot of experimentation here, but I hope that uh, that you know the whole process is not just dominated by corporations going yeah. forward. Well, Richard um, Woodcock, I yes, in the chat has raised a, a, a good point, which asks why should um, metaverse, whatever it ends up being, these metaverse platforms not be equivalent to the internet as it is today in terms of regulation? And I think that's an important idea to follow, not least because Victoria mentioned the online safety bill here in the UK, but similar acts being being brought in elsewhere in the world. And something we should maybe look at as, as a newsroom is how regulation will adapt and cope with immersive virtual worlds rather than the, the mobile phone screens and computers that we're used to using. Um, David, if we could, I'd like to go a bit further down the rabbit hole to, to talk about the idea of human consciousness being integrated into machine systems. Mm -hmm. um, you, you write quite forcefully, not just about the idea of knowledge and truth, but also about it from bits. How far can we go in uh, understanding the information, the bits that make up the things that seem to constitute our world? And I, it would be remiss not to ask you, do you think we're uploadable? I think uploading is possible in principle. So, yeah, uploading is taking the contents of a brain and gradually transferring it to a uh, to a digital device. I mean, there's gradual uploading where you uh, replace bits of your brain a bit at a time, say by by silicon chips or other digital processes. There's there's uh, all at once uploading where you scan a brain and try and then implement it in a uh, in a digital system. You may or may not destroy the brain first. I think in principle, it's possible to simulate a brain. So, uh, and then the question is, will the simulation be conscious? Will it actually be a conscious being? As well as if it's uploading, say, an in interest of immortality, if we're doing this to try and you know, survive, for example, the question also arises, will the uploaded system be me? And those mm -hmm. are both very difficult philosophical questions about consciousness and about identity. But my own view is, first, yes, it's possible to simulate a brain given sophisticated enough digital processes. Second, that the simulation will be conscious if the original system was conscious. That's to say, I mm. don't think that this, whether the substrate is biological or digital fundamentally matters to consciousness. What matters is the information processing. And third, at least if the uploading is done the right way via this kind of gradual process, I think it could be me at the other mm. end, I could survive that process. If say, if, a, if you know, 5% of my brain is replaced at a time, then I think you can make a pretty good case that what comes out the other end, the uploaded system will be a conscious, intelligent version of me. Yeah, because I'm reminded of a comment that was in the chat earlier about the long-term good. And if we're thinking long-term with this uh, concept of the metaverse, we're surely thinking neural link and with, we're thinking, uh, consciousness in a in a machine system rather than our sort of flesh and blood bodies walking around um does d should that give us pause today right the idea that actually if we embrace this technology now um and let the sort of innovation train run we might end up in a position where as i can see francis in the chat has said uploading a brain what happens when it's hacked yeah well this is a uh a tough issue for any digital reality in the future. I mean, both the, virt the virtual environment, um, it's already very, very hackable, but once our minds are actually there in the cloud too, then does that make my mind hackable? Actually, I mean, I would argue that our minds are already become partly digital simply by, you know, by use of sm my smartphone has basically become part of my mind for me. I use it for mm. remembering things, for navigating, for planning, and so on, and the internet, all kinds of bits of the internet, I would argue, are parts of my mind. So that means that already parts of my mind are in principle hackable in a way that wasn't, uh, that wasn't the case before. If somebody manipulates with the cloud in the right ways, they can manipulate my 
my memories, my plans, yeah. my navigation. But once we're yeah, fully uploaded, then that becomes a, a massive issue. And yes, cybersecurity becomes just such an extraordinarily important yeah. issue at that point. And I don't have yeah. any special insights into how to handle that technically, but suddenly it becomes a, a life and death issue. Yeah, well, I, I'd love to, if possible, go to um, Anushka Sharma, um, who has started hot and remained hot all the way through the chat. <laughs> um, and I wondered, Anushka, what, what's on your mind? Well, so much, right? Um, it's great to be here. It's great to be engaged in the chat. We're having a great time um, in parallel. I was just talking. I was just thinking about pacemakers because the FDA in America actually recalled something like half a million of them due to security risks of them being hacked. And if you think about um, the current landscape and the kind of like the cyber aspect of warfare. Things are changing rapidly, but equally, um, I was um, discussing with Paul Clark a lot about the digital twin idea of our planet, and right. I now understand the nuance in our conversation of what he's proposing, as opposed to what um, the European Space Agency is currently doing in like stitching lots of bits of data together. Um, and I'll, I can let Paul comment on on um, what he's sort of discussing, but. Yeah fascinating conversation i love snow crash if you haven't read it read it i love ready player one and david i'm so excited i've actually just ordered your book as well so yeah <laughs> there's there are a fair few references to to ready player one as well um paul if you're there it would be great to get you to weigh in not just on that but to hear your thoughts um and then i'd love to talk about matrix yeah, I, I suppose, as I, I said in the chat, I just think we have to start by thinking about, you know, why we're building these virtual worlds and what we want to do with them, rather than them just being sort of revenue generating and data harvesting mechanisms for hyperscalers. And, and you know, there are some incredibly important challenges we face, whether it's future pandemics or climate change resilience, climate change intervention, planetary leveling up, you know, whatever you want to call it, that... To, to, I think I think to sort of limit the vision for metaverses to being immersive virtual worlds, 3D virtual worlds for sort of gaming and meeting people and doing stuff is is just well, it's a massive lost opportunity. Right. And I think, um, you know, we found out what happens when you put a bunch of leaders in a room um, mm. and ask them to solve climate change. I think we need to find tools that allow us to do it in a much more bottom up nudging in you know way how at a hyper local way you know um you know across national boundaries you know mm. at a planetary scale yeah so um i'm David, fascinated by the way by this digital John. twin idea and, and interested to hear more about it is paul maybe we need of the earth how how far along is that right now paul uh well the, you know there's a there's a quite a large group of stakeholders you know, some of them are on this call working on the vision for a national digital twin, which is mm -hmm. a properly big earth shot in its own right, K kicking that up to a planetary scale, um, like ESA are talking about and the Met Office and others is, you know, uh, is really important. But I, I think that's really focused more, you know, as uh, Anushka was saying, on the kind of given it's one minute to midnight, how do we Make sure we pull the levers in the right way. Given that we we haven't, you know, we need to innovate faster and safer and so forth. Mm. Whereas I think the idea of gamifying climate change, you know, for citizens is something subtly different. I think they're both important, but for different purposes. And I think we need both. Um, and um, but you know, the, there's a bunch of us on this call who are passionate about digital twins. Sad though that may be. But this really is like using using the metaverse for new forms of governance and decision making. This is really what's what's driving this. Fantastic. I think perhaps you guys should speak afterwards, but I, I would want to ask um, in, in the in the matrix, David, the world is destroyed not by climate change, but by um, a, a war with a machine species. But it's destroyed all the same. And it's not the world that we knew. Um, and it feels like it could, in a, in the disastrous situation that we're facing with climate change, and end up looking something like that. I, I wanted to pick at the idea that this stuff is an escape from problems that we have, um, and some people would call them real problems. What, what's your view on that? Plugging yourself in, taking the the pill, remaining in the 
that of goo rather than encountering the the very difficult but real stuff out there yeah i mean there's got to be some element of link linkage between these things physical neglect and virtual worlds for example if it turns out we do massively neglect the virtual world so that the earth is ruined in various respects then that will certainly increase the attractiveness of virtual worlds as an alternative um, so that could motivate the development of virtual worlds but i think this idea that the development of virtual worlds is going to inevitably lead to neglect of the physical world i just find that under that under motivated i mean if sure if absolutely everyone was suddenly going to spend all their time in virtual mm. worlds and this could decrease our attention to the physical world but i don't think anything like that is going to happen anytime soon for a start many people have a very strong preference for physical reality and are going to stay anchored there yeah for, for our next thing we're going to need the physical world to you know the virtual world exists within a physical world it's implemented within a physical world we're going to need a uh, a robust physical mm. environment for uh, for virtual worlds to exist between and more generally i think you know as human beings we're capable of thinking about more than one thing at once we can think about the environment and we can think about injustice and we can think about virtual worlds i mean yeah there have been all kinds of pathologies and obstacles towards our thinking straight about taking care of our environment but as far as i can tell you know those obstacles haven't involved oh my god let's spend all our time in uh, in virtual worlds or uh, yeah. other spaces instead it's very it's very different pathologies that have got gotten in the way there yeah so it may be that it comes sort of overwhelmingly from skeptics and, and people with an agenda but there is some evidence as far as i understand that experiences like the the metaverse experience of Fortnite, the game or and a number of others are proving quite addictive um mm -hmm. for young people is that a sign of something worse to come for generations of people who are sort of even more digitally native than the young people we have around today who are like pretty digitally native yeah it's an interesting question i mean there have always been addictive experiences virtual or yeah. uh, or not and maybe uh maybe a you know a generation ago or a couple of generations ago it wasn't some virtual activity but it was a, a bunch of different uh non-virtual activities whether it's you know food or uh, or sex or physical gaming or mm. or whatever so i guess the one question is whether there's something distinctively bad if it if uh if the virtual becomes addictive and eats up a lot of uh a lot of say kids times you might just say that um that's kind of generic part of being in the uh in the human species um if it turned out that again all of you know the whole thing got so addictive that all of us started spending 24 hours a day maybe you know people talk about the wire heading system where we just get these little little bolts of pleasure so that all of us suddenly want to spend 24 hours a day getting these bolts of pleasure mm. yeah well that would be a uh, that would be a disaster i'm going to say right now i don't see this happening in fact right now right now at least virtual worlds are non-addictive um, right i think uh yeah people talked about uh the, the migraines and so on i mean a lot of people get you spend an hour in vr and it's enough i gotta say my own experience is i find the internet fully addictive i can spend 12 hours browsing the internet on my desktop screen no problems at all but i do not find vr fully addictive i spend mm. half an hour or an hour there now maybe um maybe over time i mean over time the technology is going to uh going to get better but i'm not sure that it suddenly ends up being a worse thing if if vr is addictive than if the uh the internet is addictive. yeah well i mean we're, we're we're certainly seeing problems along those lines and i'm struck actually by the idea that maybe as the immersiveness goes up so does the intensiveness of our use and therefore maybe so do the the problems i can see um chris simcoe i don't know if you're there chris um you talking about roadblocks yeah um my 12 year old daughter if i just let her she she loves her room and if i just let her she would stay playing roblox the entire time i mean that's not you know it's not vr but you're on there you're chatting to people mm -hmm. you can get jobs you can earn money um yeah, yeah. and, and, you know, what, and what what it. what has that made you think about this concept of of the metaverse and and some of the stuff we we've, we've been discussing um, well, I, I think I think 
the idea that people won't get addicted to it um, is wrong. I think they will. But I think, um, I do think there will be many different metaverses. I also think that most of it will be user generated content, mm -hmm. just, you know, like Roblox is. That's why it took off. Yeah. Um, I think that raises all sorts of uh, questions about. Um, you know, the economics of you, you buy things, can you take them with you? Um, you know, can you exchange goods between different metaverses? But I like the idea you mentioned earlier about the, the dimming of the reality mm -hmm. versus not. I think that might that mm -hmm. might help in a way, you know, if she could sit at the dinner table and dim it a bit so she could eat her dinner, but <laughs> still be on there if she would. Yeah. So, um, there, there yeah. might be an addiction, but you might be able to get people to tune in and out gradually at different yeah. times. Yeah, the Roblox is super interesting because yeah, they are right now a gaming company where they basically are, uh, you know, allow kids and other developers to develop these gaming worlds where then other users can come in and play these games. My sense is um, that they are moving towards being something more than that, that they want, you know, this class already, they call their game, they don't call their games games, they call them experiences. And I think it's, I think there's signs that uh, they would like this eventually to be, you know, a version of the uh, the metaverse that's not limited to gaming where kids and other developers can develop mm. virtual worlds for all kinds of purposes that go well beyond gaming. And then in the end, you know, adults too will be uh, using these uh, social virtual worlds designed by users. At that point, I start to get less worried about addiction when it was, um, when it was say it was addiction to gaming, then okay, well, of course, if that's taken to extremes, there are problems. Once it starts being virtual worlds, which are social virtual worlds where people can, you know, build communities, can be uh, can be employed, can build relationships, can engage in political movements, and so on. At that point, you know, it, the the fact that people are spending twelve hours a day in virtual worlds no longer seems so obviously to be a, uh, a problem for me, then I think at that point, they're actually having meaningful lives in virtual worlds. I mean, I'm addicted to all kinds of things. I'm addicted to books, but I don't, mm. I don't think my addiction to books is a, uh, is a terrible thing because it's actually, it's, you know, it's got all kinds of benefits in my life to, to have this addiction. Maybe addictions to gaming have, has downsides, but a mere addiction to spending time in virtual worlds. Well, yeah, people are, I'm addicted to spending time, as, time in certain aspect places in the physical world too. That's only a problem if virtual worlds are a problem. Mm. It, uh, Chris, please do come come back on that if you want. You might have to. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say it's interesting to say that because actually, what she does in there, she spends all of her time building things. Mm, interesting. That's it. She'll build something. She built um, the Maldives. You know, you walk on a uh -huh. plane, you come out the other side, you're in the Maldives in a resort. She's never been there. Um, and then she just destroys it. If you don't catch her, you never see it because she destroys it. So she could, she's building a town now. Um, you know, so people come and work. She built them, you know, she built uh, like a, a school and people come and work there. I mean, it's just so. So it's kind of like the it's the new version of Lego. Um, so I, right. I try not to be too, you know, she's yeah. she's building. I'm sure there's useful skills she's building. Yeah, um, maybe so, this is, yeah, is, is, it a game, is going to be extremely not? meaningful in her future career as a VR developer. She's yeah. helping to design the metaverse. I, I think there certainly is a thread here, which is about um, being able to see the potential for good. As you, you, you talk a bit, David, in your book about good and about meaningfulness and about quality in life. And I think for our purposes, we don't want to get fixated on the harms. Um, I can see that Paul Clark again has put um, another point in the chat where he says we may well reach a tipping point where we do more in the metaverse than we do in the real world, as it were. But that more is problem solving, um, acquiring skills, building networks um, and earn, earning money. What what do you, uh, you, you would you describe yourself as a sort of metaverse positivist, as it were? A positivist meaning someone who's positive towards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm an optimist. I mean, one thing you might say is I'm an I, I'm what philosophers call an ideal theorist. I mean, I'm I'm kind of engaged in thinking about an ideal of what's possible. I think I see a vision of how a metaverse could be and could be good, and I'm inclined to especially focus 
on that. But there's also like what we call the non-ideal theory, all the ways it could go wrong. Yeah. And it's probably fair to say that at least in the book, I focus more on what's possible than on yeah. the ways in which it could go wrong. And maybe that's a reflection of either my optimistic nature or my uh, character as a philosopher. But I am increasingly starting to think about all the ways it can uh, it can go wrong. Not least because I'm you know I'm increasingly being asked to you know consult with uh, you know yeah. corporations and policy groups and so on about this. And it's just is the non ideal theory and all the ways it can go wrong are absolutely fascinating too. And not also philosophically interesting. You know manipulation and so on connects to issues about free will. There are issues about you know identity which uh, tie into to very deep issues about identity too. So I think in the in the coming period, I am I would describe myself as someone who's ultimately optimistic about the metaverse, but I am going to yeah. try and spend a lot of time thinking about all the ways in which that vision could go wrong. So so be before we finish, because time's really run away, um, I, I, I'm I'm really interested to know. So what sort of things are companies asking you to? help them to think about when it comes to this? Is it products they're building, services? What like what what do those conversations normally look like? Yeah, well, this is just uh, just really just starting for me, especially since this book came out uh, yeah. about a month ago. Um, but I've, I've already had a number of, uh, of, you know, corporations get in touch about talking to them and their uh, developers or workers, company as a whole, for example, about how to build, uh, how to build community, for example, mm. in these, uh, in these uh, virtual worlds. And so on. Uh, what makes actually for you know meaningful interactions in uh, in these virtual worlds? I'm very interested in these questions of the ethics and of virtual worlds. You know, this issue of uh, of assault and you know uh, virtual assault and the you know the four foot boundaries and so on. This raises very deep issues about the ethics of virtual worlds and how should these uh, these interactions in virtual worlds be thought about ethically and uh, as well as politically and legally. And mm. so on. So, you know, so far, those are some of the uh, some of the questions I'm getting. But um, yeah, really, my thoughts on these things are very much developing. Yeah. Well, well I, I'll certainly be following them closely um, and can't, can't wait for whatever's next um, in terms of your your books. Um, we, we've got to finish. And I, I think, um, first of all, I, I've been involved in a lot of thinkings and there are a few where there's been such a sort of depth um, and passion of discussion in in the chat alongside, and I think that really speaks, David, to how engaging and important these subjects are. Um, I am I am going to save a copy of the chat, by the way. So I read bits and pieces of it as it went along, but I had to miss. Uh, miss I can email it. it I'm really you. looking forward to going through it in some detail. Yeah, yeah, we'll make sure you get it. Um, just just to say a few few things at the top from from Tortoise's perspective, I think it's really important we're aware of that question you raised, David, about who's the first to build the most compelling, best functionality for engaging with Metaverse? Um, and what incentive do they have to use universal standards? I think is a big question and one that we need to follow. I, I was struck also by the point you made about 2030 to 2060 maybe being the, the, the period in which this tipping point or this transition takes place. Um, part of what Paul Clark's been saying is the move over to where we do most of our useful, meaningful stuff in these immersive digital experiences. And I, I think there's also something in the fact that 2030 is the year in which we're supposedly going to achieve net zero across a lot of uh, parts of the world. And Paul, you raised the question of planetary challenges. Um, I like IPL versus IVL um, and making the distinction around, as you argue in your book, David, the that digital objects can be real objects and, and digital experiences can and also should be considered real. Um, there were some really good questions from Brett, from Bex, from Victoria, asking about what's the long-term good that we're hoping to unleash by innovating in the metaverse. And I think that is a really, really important question and takes us to some of what you've just mentioned, David, at the end about ethics and trust. And I can see David um, and uh, David Lane and Paul Clark have had a back and forth about uh, people's ownership of data. I'd love to follow the hardware. Um, I, I'd love to know more about bodysuits and haptic gloves and things that contribute to what you were saying, David, at the top about immersiveness. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. I really hope everybody's in, enjoyed it. Thank you so much, David Chalmers. 
Um, I everybody should should get a copy of this book and read it, um, and then read it again. The illustrations are also really good. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I hope we'll see you again at another thinking. <laughs>